Good morning, young scholars. Um, okay, so some of the questions on the study guide are beyond the section you read. Uh, just leave them blank. Um, today I'm going to go over the section. I have to go back a little bit. There's some stuff I want to cover on page 27, actually. Um, and until I find a better way to do it, I'm going to use this uh, PowerPoint and recording thing. All right. Um, so I'm on page 27 in the book. Uh, and at the bottom of the page, this is after um, the boy got nervous being in the father's home and wanted to leave. <sighs> um, the bottom of page 27 says, three nights later in the foothills of the eastern mountains, he woke in the darkness to hear something coming. He lay with his hands at either side of him. The ground was trembling. It was coming toward them. Papa, the boy said. Papa? Shh, it's okay. What is it, Papa? It neared, growing louder, everything trembling. Then it passed beneath them like an underground train and drew away into the night and was gone. The boy clung to him, crying, his head buried against his chest. Shh, it'll be all right. I'm so scared. I know, I know, it's going to be all right. It's gone. What is it, Papa? It was an earthquake. It's gone now. We're all right. Shh. Um, okay, so just maybe a little bit of um, foreshadowing of the dread there. And then there's a flashback, sort of, or a reflection by the man. In those first years, the roads were peopled with refugees shrouded up in their clothing, wearing masks and goggles, sitting in their rags by the side of the road like ruined aviators, their barrows heaped with shoddy, towing wagons or carts, their eyes bright in their skulls, creedless shells of men tottering down the causeways like migrants in a fever land. The frailty of everything revealed at last, old and troubling issues resolved into nothingness and night. The last instance of a thing takes the class with it, turns out the light and is gone. Look around you, ever is a long time. But the boy knew what he knew, that ever is no time at all. All right, so this is a reflection on the early years. Um, and it says certain details there might be confusing. Their eyes bright in their skulls, creedless shells of men tottering down the causeways like migrants in a fever land. Uh, this word creedless men, uh, creed is a belief system. These men have, uh, they're shells of men. They no longer have any beliefs. It's all about uh, survival very quickly. It says the frailty of everything revealed at last, the, uh, the sense that we were always very close to uh, turning into this. It was a frail situation. We were distracted by comfort and ease and um, immediately afterward, um, uh, we, we went straight directly to, to sort of our lizard brains, uh, survival instincts, all right? Uh, no kindness, no family, no brotherhood, which is in the line, the last instance of a thing takes the class with it, not the school class, but like genus, species, order, class, that sort of a thing. Uh, basically saying the last of a thing, whether it be a pizza uh, or whatever, once it's gone, it takes the whole concept with it. I know I kind of went over that um, last time. So I'm going to jump ahead a bit. On page 29, um, there is, uh, again, some concrete imagery. They squatted in the road and ate ice cold rice and cold beans that they cooked days ago, already, already beginning uh, to ferment. No place to make a fire that would not be seen. They slept huddled together in the rank quilts of the dark and the cold. He held the boy close to him so thin. My heart, he said, my heart. But he knew that if uh, he were a good father, still it might be well as, sorry, it might well be as she had said, that the boy was all that stood between him and death. In other words, uh, again, this is returning to the theme um, that we need something besides ourselves to, to live for. Um, and, um, and in this case, taking care of the son is the only reason he goes on. Taking care of himself would not be enough. Um, okay, then we get a sense of like it's late in the year and he knows that everything depends on getting um, to the south and to the coast. Um, they passed through ruins of a resort town and took the road south. On page uh, 30, he stood on a stone bridge where the waters slurried into a pool and stood, uh, sorry, and turned slowly in gray foam where he'd once watched trout stay, swaying in the current tracking the perfect shadows on the stones beneath. They went on, the boy trudging in his track. 
Um, already it was hard going and he stopped often to rest, slogging to the edge of the road with his back to the child where he stood bent with his hands on his knees, coughing. He raised up and stood with weeping eyes on the gray snow, a fine mist of blood. Um, again, another indication that things are uh, kind of urgent. Um, the fact that he is coughing blood is that implies that he's in a very extremely bad um, health. Uh, and on page 31, uh, he's watching the kid stoke the flames, God's own fire drake, that's a sort of dragon. The sparks rushed upward and dried in the starless night. Not all dying words are true, and this blessing is no less real for being shorn of its ground. He uses that word shorn a lot. It means cut off from, like to shear. Um, if something is shorn of its ground, it is no longer uh, grounded. It is kind of lost and untethered. Um, all right, they come across a forest fire. The color of it moves something in him, long forgotten. Make a list, recite a litany, remember. Um, so there, fire is a color he doesn't see very much. Everything is gray in this world, gray, dark, white, or black. Um, the color of it moves something in him long forgotten, make a list, recite a litany, that is recite like a list with some sort of meaning. All right, it's him trying to remember sometimes uh, things that he normally doesn't. On page 32, a reflection on his wife. In his dream, she was sick and he cared for her. The dream bore the look of sacrifice, but he thought differently. He did not take care of her and she died alone somewhere in the dark. And there is no other dream. And there is no other dream nor other waking world, and there is no other tale to tell. So something dark about the loss of the, um, about the loss of his wife, the mother of the kid. On this road, there are no God-spoke men. They are gone, and I am left, and they have taken with them the world. Query: How does one? How does the never to be differ from what never was? That's a confusing question, um, but he's contemplating how there are no God-spoke men on the road. Meaning, well, that's a made-up word, but no men that believe in uh, any form of higher power, right? He reflects again on the first year at the bottom of page 32. It says, people sitting in the sidewalk in the dawn, half immolate and smoking in their clothes. So people sitting on the sidewalk half on fire or burnt up, like failed sectarian suicides. A sectarian suicide would be um, sort of like that Buddhist monk you saw in your history book setting himself on fire. Um, so he's talking about people on the sides of the road, burnt up. Others would come to help them. Within a year, there were fires on the ridges and deranged chanting, the screams of the murdered. By day, the dead impaled on spikes along the road. What had they done? He thought that in the history of the world, it might even be that there was more punishment than crime, but he took small comfort in it. So a couple of thoughts there. Um, like I said before, people didn't just turn to cannibalism. They created rituals and symbols um, indicating that people need these things. They invented, uh, they, there was deranged chanting and the murdered, uh, screams of the murdered. And then they impaled, that means to run a spike through people uh, along the road. So you'd walk down the road and there would be people hanging from spikes. None of that is about the necessity to survive. That is creating ritual around something grisly like cannibalism All right. um moving forward um there's the little conversation on page 34 about the cocoa um in a pocket of his knapsack he'd found a last half of the pack of cocoa and he fixed it for the boy <clears throat> and then poured his own cup with hot water and sat blowing at the rim he promised not to do that the boy said what you know what papa he poured the hot water back into the pan and took the boy's cup and poured some of the cocoa into his own and then handed it back. I have to watch you all the time, the boy said. I know. If you break little promises, you'll break big ones. That's what you said. I know, but I won't. It seems like a minor thing, but basically what happened is the father didn't want wanted the boy to have all that was left of the cocoa, but he had made, but he had tricked him. Um, and this is where a couple things happen. One is the lessons the, bo the father teaches the boy, the boy holds on to. And like many parents, he doesn't necessarily live up to him himself. But the boy kind of throws it back in his face. Also, the boy is an absolutist. If you say, don't lie, 
then you don't lie, even if the lie is to help the boy. Um, the man bends the rules. We'll, we'll notice that later, that it's more, his is more of a um, relative morality um, as, a boy, as opposed to the boy's, which is um, absolute. Wrong is always wrong, regardless of the content or the um, intention. Okay. Bottom of page 35, um, still they came to trees across the road where they were forced to unload the cart and carry everything over the trunks and then repack it all on the far side. The boy found toys he forgot he had. He kept out a yellow truck and they went on with it sitting on top of the tarp. A uh, little attempt to hold on to something of his childhood. Um, on page 36, he woke whimpering in the night and the man held him. Shh, he said, Shh, it's okay. I had a bad dream. I know. Should I tell you what it was? If you want to. I had this penguin that you wind up and it would waddle and flap its flippers. And we were in that house that we used to live in and it came around the corner, but nobody had wound it up and it was really scary. Okay. It was a lot scarier in the dream. I know dreams can be really scary. Why did I have that scary dream? I don't know, but it's okay now. I'm going to put some wood on the fire and go to sleep. The boy didn't answer. Then he said, the winder wasn't talking. So the boy's uh, toys actually become an element of his nightmares. Of course, this is what the uh, father kind of wants him to have. A person in peril should feel the peril. Um, okay, on page 38 is the waterfall that I asked about in the question. Um, they found the waterfall. The waterfall fell into the pool, almost at its center, a gray curved circle. They stood side by side, calling to each other over the din. That's the noise. Is it cold? Yes, it's freezing. Do you want to go in? I don't know. Sure you do. Is it okay? Come on. He unzipped his parka and let, the, let it fall to the gravel, and the boy stood up, and they undressed and walked out into the water, ghostly pale and shivering. The boy so thin, it stopped his heart. He dove headlong and came up gasping and turned and stood, beating his arms. Is it over my head, the boy called? No, come on. Um, so here again, he's trying to get the boy to have a little bit of a childhood, a little bit of fun, um, but uh, we see that he's kind of lost track of how much they're actually starving. The boy is uh, so skinny, it actually shocks him. All right. Um, over on page 41 is um, more on the waterfall. And in fact, um, it's dangerous, the answer to that question that you don't have. Um, in fact, I'm going to keep the reading pretty low, but I am going to keep you moving a little bit. Um, so I'm going to suggest only that you read up to page, uh, let's see, up to page 48. Okay, so you're just going to read eight more pages. The rest of the time you can, um, of this period, you can ask me questions. Um, right now we'll do it in the chat. Like I said, I'm gonna try to figure out some better things um, for communicating. Um, and your projects, the written portion is due on Friday. Your study guide questions, um, I will post a due date for them. All right, when you get to page 48, you will be able to answer the waterfall and the truck question, but not the one about the first person he's talked to. I think what I'm going to do is not collect the questions yet. I'll post that in an announcement or an assignment. Okay, young scholars, uh, go ask me questions in the conference and have a nice day.